Hey everybody, it's Chris. Welcome to another Crispy Cancer interview. And today I'm bringing my friend Dr. Frank Sabatino from the Balance for Life Retreat Center in Florida. I had the opportunity to go hang out with Frank for a few days earlier this year and get to know him better. And uh, he is amazing. I mean, the guy has got so much wisdom and knowledge, expertise, and uh, I'm so excited for what you're going to hear from Frank in this interview um, because his brain, I just, I, I'm excited to pick his brain. So, hey, Dr. Frank. Good hey, to be hello, here. hello, hello to everybody out there. I'm happy to be here. So, you've got a lot of experience with nutrition, with fasting, with cancer, and uh, I would love to start with your backstory to help people understand how you became who you are. And, uh, and we'll, I, you know, we'll just, uh, we'll roll with it here. Yeah. You know, I grew up. I grew up in an Italian household in the Bronx in New York City many moons ago, when dinosaurs roamed the earth. Uh, being <laughs> back in New York recently, they still roam the Bronx. That hasn't changed a whole lot. But anyway, back in those days, eating a very typical Italian family, you know, cuisine, which was loaded with meat, dairy, and all of that, I had a long history of colitis as a child, and very upset stomachs and bowel-related issues all the time. And you know, growing up in New York. I was taken to some of the best experts, gastroenterologists and people in the world in the city of New York. And it was always amazing to me how little even gastroenterologists at that level of knowledge felt that diet had any relationship to what happens in the bowel or the gut. So I went along, I just kept doing the same stuff. No one ever made any connection. So I had all of these issues. And it wasn't until I really started going to college that I met a man who was the father of a very close friend and he had collected kind of an anti-medical library over like 20 to 30 years through all these pioneers of lifestyle, early lifestyle medicine, early lifestyle changes. So I started to read my way through his library because every time I came, he knew I was in a pre-med program going in that direction. So he would attack me at every turn. So I started reading my way through his library and I started sampling just plant-only living, very vegetarian at that time probably a little bit of fish, a little bit of dairy still going on in my teenage years. But it was very intriguing to me that by adopting that eating plan, all of those bowel-related issues became a thing of the past. And I felt that it was pretty remarkable that after 15 years of medical mismanagement, it took an insurance salesman from the Bronx to solve the problem of colitis. So then I started really going and investigating that. I decided chiropractic would be a better path for me because I would still be able to work with people professionally but not have to deal with drugs and surgery. So in going through chiropractic college, I opened a club. I brought in all these experts that were involved with fasting care. I got to know all these doctors through what used to be called the natural hygiene movement back in the day. And, you know, Herbert Shelton and all these early fasting institutions and all of that. Fasting so I, can save your life. Herbert okay. Shelton. Fasting can save your life. All of those books. Natural hygiene, the pristine way of life. So I read my way through all of that. Wait, wait, look. There you go. You're ready. Actually, someone approached me recently to do an updated version of that now to rewrite, to rewrite that book. You should, started, man. And I think we're going to do that. Anyway, so to make the story short, I started then uh, after chiropractic college, I had an opportunity to work in a fasting institution. And it was the Shangri-La Natural Hygiene Institute. I was 27 years old. It was my first trial by fire job. We had 100 plus people a week. We had 50 people a week fasting in that place. It was only 300 bucks a week back in the day. And everybody, including celebrities, everybody came and I got my trial by fire. But my background was going through my own health issues. And then there was an episode before I went to chiropractic college. We're traveling in Europe after a period of drug use and going through all the fermentation of the late 60s in New York where I came back from Italy after visiting family and overeating and doing all of this, where I had a major bowel crisis. And I went into a situation where I lost about 30 to 40 pounds in a week. And it looked almost like a cholera out, outbreak, truthfully. So I had all of this stuff, and now I was stuck with this dilemma of what to do. And I wasn't a doctor at the time, and like most people, when you see that kind of change, I was full of fear. But I had read about fasting, and I said, you know what? I'm going to put myself in my mother's back bedroom and I'm going to fast whether I live or die. That's truly the mindset I got into. 
And what was intriguing is in the first few days of fasting, I actually gained a few pounds because I stopped dehydrating to death, which was what was happening. And I fasted about 12 days. I had a sense after that that it was time to eat, and I ate. took me about six months to put that weight back on. But that was kind of the beginning of really seeing that in my own life before I even had the opportunity to take care of some very seriously ill people with fasting. So from my early beginnings through the introduction to Uncle Luigi, the insurance salesman, to me meeting all these hygienic pioneers and me putting this plant-based thing in my life with a little bit of fasting and resolving a major set of health issues, that kind of propelled me into the next stages. And then I went into doing what I did with the uh, Fasting Institute in Florida and I decided after that that I wanted to do some other research. So I literally, as a glutton for punishment, went back to medical school and spent the next eight to 10 years getting a PhD in neuroendocrinology and uh, cell, cell biology. And I was involved with some of the landmark research at the University of Texas on calorie restriction and aging. And then it led to me opening, uh, being attracted to another health center in South Florida where I operated for about 25 years. Fast forward, I'm at the Balance for Life Center now. So it was a whole history. And raising five kids and a family in between all of that, which was a whole dance in itself, as you well know as a father. So all of that was part of my whole thing. But I was very fortunate because at the University of Texas, I was involved in probably the earliest landmark research that is now all of what comes into intermittent fasting, which at that point was calorie restriction and aging. And so my interest has now, it's been for 40 years, because I've done this for 40 years, lived as a plant-based person and a plant-based physician, counseling thousands of people and probably fasting close to 10,000 people on water only. I guess you know what you're talking about. <laughs> a, little <laughs> a little bit. Yes, a little bit. Yeah. So, okay. So I would love to, man, there's so many different places we can go and we'll, we may have to do a part two. But I would love to um, to talk about fasting. Uh, I'd love for you to explain why fasting is beneficial, just for the, for the for the average person who just like has never thought about it, knows nothing about it. Then I'd also love for you to talk about uh, fasting and plant based nutrition as it relates to health and even cancer, especially, and why eating animal foods. Uh, are problematic. Why they? How? How and why do they promote disease? So I know that's a lot of questions. So <laughs> anyway, you can start with anyone you want. Let's start, let's start with the fasting first, because so we can talk about that. There's a lot of evidence across all species, including humans, that you know all animals, including us, have had to adapt to this cycle when food was in abundance and when there was scarcity. I mean, if you go back in our own history, there were probably periods of time where we had an abundance of food. But then because it was very difficult to get, whether you went out to hunt and kill or whatever, there could be long periods when you didn't eat again. So the body had, we had this, this situation where we had to adapt to periods of scarcity as well as abundance. And it appears that in that model of change and evolution, we developed the internal ability to adapt to periods of scarcity. And so what we now find is that we can go extended periods of time without the intake of any food whatsoever. But the body, of course, needs liquid, it needs fluid. And when it goes into this fasting state, water only, which I'm gonna discriminate from juices and other kind of fractured kind of fast that people think about, this is water only fasting. All of that energy that would now be tied up in the obtaining, procuring, digesting of food, now can be directed at something else. And that something else typically winds up being detoxification, repair, things of that nature. Because the body makes unique adjustments to the lack of food where it now has to lean on reserves, usually protein and fat, and eventually mostly fat, to provide the energy and sugar needs that the brain, the cells require. So fasting in this resting state provides this remarkable uh, harboring, if you will, of energy that can now be devoted to healing and repair. So is there a difference in your mind uh, between what the body's doing during fasting and what the body's doing during a high-fat ketogenic diet? 
Yeah, the difference is, is that you, in both cases, on a high-fat ketogenic diet, again, those, those diets can be as much as 92% fat, a little spanking of, of sugar, maybe 1%. So you're going to go into, when you take sugar away from the body, which is happening in a ketogenic diet, but in fasting, you're taking everything away. So the bottom line is we need, we need sugar to meet the energy needs of the cells in the brain. But if sugar is not available, the body has no choice but to create energy from other existing substances. And in the body, that's only two things. That's protein and fat. So what we find on water fasting is that under resting conditions, the protein loss is really very, very small. In fact, you may only lose after the third day of fasting as much as a half an ounce of protein a day. So if you fasted 30 days, that would only be about a pound of protein while you're losing one to two pounds of weight a day. So it's a very small percentage of your weight loss. And the body shifts dramatically into fat metabolism to provide energy for the brain and body. In a ketogenic diet, you're kind of doing the same thing, except that with all the movement and all of the things that go on, there can be more of a dangerous metabolic acidosis in terms of protein loss and things of that nature, which is much more conserved in the fasting state because it's under, and we only do it under extreme resting conditions. So that whole issue of providing that nutrient deficit triggers something in fasting that we don't quite see the same way in a ketogenic diet because you still have nutrients coming in like pro, small amount of protein, small amount of carb, a lot of fat. And so we don't see the process of um, cellular cleanup and repair the same way. There's, a, there's something that happens in a fast called autophagy, A-U-T-O-P-H-A-G-Y, which you can, set, you can pronounce it autophagy. It just means self-eating, where there's a cellular process where the body cleans up debris and is able to take broken down protein, broken down debris and parts of cells, take from it what it can use, like amino acids and fatty acids, and build up the body from it. It would almost be like having rusty nails and wood in the corner of a room and being able to build the Taj Mahal from that. It's a magical, almost mysterious, mystical process that happens, but it only really happens when the nutrient levels are really taken away from the body so that it now has to lean on that inner, that inner process of protection and repair. And autophagy is a, an amazing process that happens to the greatest degree in water-only fasting. It will happen to some degree in fractured diets, even ketogenic diets, but the metabolic acidosis of eating all that animal fat and that high protein can be very problematic because all of that fat can get into cells very easily, load cells up with fat, crowd out the energy factories, mitochondria, make insulin resistant worse. We already know that type 2 diabetes happens a lot more when you're consuming a lot of animal fat and oils because it interferes with insulin's ability to allow sugar to enter cells. So fasting to me is what I'll call the safe ketogenic diet because it's under extreme resting conditions, harboring energy only for that work of repair and for situations like autophagy, this remarkable inner process of cellular cleaning. And, and stabilization. So to me, it's very, very different. And when you're eating, and we already know, for example, that when you're consuming high animal protein diets, because you asked about that, we find that there are changes where the thing that really triggers autophagy and fasting is that when you take away sugar and protein foods and fat, there is a tremendous drop in two things. One is something called insulin-like growth factor, and the other is glucose. So when both of those drop, insulin levels regulate. We have less growth because the cells don't have raw material to grow with, and the cell goes into a protective maintenance function when those two things drop. So what happens is when you have high protein intake or animal protein and fat, you have a remarkable increase in insulin-like growth factor. And we now know that insulin-like growth factor is one of those things that triggers cancer change in most cells. So just from a cancer standpoint, high animal protein intake is probably one of the best ingredients for promoting cancer. But we also know that because it's so acidifying, it can also lead to 
acidosis. It can lead to inflammatory changes on blood vessel walls, increasing the risk of heart disease, increasing the risk of inflammatory change. We know the bacteria in the gut. There's nine different species of bacteria that produce something called trimethylamine oxide, TMAO. When you eat the carnitine in high amounts and choline from meat and dairy, that's going to trigger the, uh, an increase in heart disease and stroke risk and morbidity from heart disease. So there's so many things, that, but the underlying problem with animal products is that it is incredibly inflammatory provoking. And we now know that inflammation is the foundation for most chronic diseases. It causes damage to blood vessel walls, plaque forms, oxygen in blood is blocked, cells begin to die, you've got disease. You talked about having colitis as a kid. I did. And so we have that in common, uh, not colitis, but digestive disease. I had colon cancer. You had colitis. Um, colon inflammation is also often a precursor to more serious disease like colon cancer. Um, I, didn't, I didn't have any inflammatory colon diseases leading up to it, but anyway, I got colon cancer. And you're right, you know, it's surprising. I even asked my surgeon, hey, is there any food I need to avoid after he cut out a third of my large intestine? And his answer to me was, no, just don't lift anything heavier than a beer. Oh my God, it's just remarkable to me at that level because these are not stupid people. These are very learned people. And you would think the connection between what is going into your digestive system would have an impact on the major parts of your digestive system. And people just don't, on the medical profession level, they just don't make that link. It's remarkable to me. But the thing that's interesting is we have a, you know, we, we now know that so much of that bowel health relies on this microbiota, this incredible population of organisms that live within us. And you've got to pose the question. We have 10 trillion cells. We have 100 trillion of these organisms. You've got to pose the question, what is that there for? Why do we have that? And we now know that when you're eating high-fiber plant-based foods, the starch in those fibers are fermented by that bacterial population to produce these short-chain fatty acids that absolutely heal and protect the lining of the bowel. There's Butyrate. Nothing, there's nothing yet. The butyrate, which is one of those short-chain fatty acids, creates that mucus lining, that healthy mucus lining. But you know what? When you're eating refined foods without fiber, a lot of the junk that people eat, you're feeding the upper intestine and nothing makes it to those bacteria. So they got to eat too. So they start eating that lining. And what happens is you start getting gaps in that lining, which people call leaky gut, and you have the beginning of inflammation where now large molecules can seep through a lining that was really designed to be very like a very tight mesh to block things. So now you get the foundation of immune responses to these large protein fragments, and now you've got the beginning of autoimmune disease. And so the body starts attacking its own joints. It starts attacking stuff, but it all stems from that damage that has gone on in that gut lining. We know that butyrate is one of the most protective things for cells, the epithelial cells of the colon, to protect against uh, colon cancer. And so when they're not able to produce that butyrate, when they're not getting those fibers from those plant-based foods, and again, when you have that fiber, you also have a better transit time. So toxic material in the bowel is not lingering in that location of the gut, wearing away and damaging those cells. So there's so much with plant-based nutrition that we now know that goes even beyond what we're feeding us, but also what we're feeding that incredible population of organisms that live within us as protection. And it's a remarkable thing in cancer because the stuff that the bacteria are producing is altering us on a genetic level to either promote or suppress cancer outcome. And I find that remarkable. And if you think about it, the bacterial population we have has 200 times the genetic material that we do as an entire organism. So you got to pose the question, what's all that genetic material doing in our bodies? We now know that they're modifying some of the chemicals in plants to change the actual gene structure of the cells in our own bowel to either express or block cancer expression. I, I think that's just remarkable to me. Oh, it's absolutely fascinating and exciting too because you, you, nutrition is uh, so overlooked, so taken for granted. 
and uh, so just underestimated in its power. Um, there's a there's a new study that has come out really just in the last week, two weeks. You may have seen it, maybe not, but they um, these researchers have just sort of you know uncovered the fact that there are a hundred million bacteria in an apple just in an apple and an apple might be the best probiotic of all right now they haven't compared it to every other fruit and vegetable so there's it, i think this is going to bust open a whole new uh field of research on uh bacterial composition in every plant food on earth but anyway so right now they've got this study on the apple and what they found that was a it's fascinating that there's a hundred million bacteria it might be a hundred billion it's one of the two. I'll link to it in the show notes. But the point is, uh, 90 million, let's just say. Or 90%, right. 90% are in the core and the seeds, the part that people aren't eating. Right. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah. You know, years ago, it was funny. Remember, there was a time with cancer care. You had that whole model of Laetrile, people eating apple seeds and eating all of that. Yes. As it turns out, this is another story that has to be addressed because we're looking at another whole level of input and the truth is yeah and even if you think about the fact that the apple provides that while providing the fiber that's the best prebiotic to feed right. the already existing organisms that are there it, it it just hammer you know it's always amazing to me what really what really blows my mind and what i really love is that as you get into these deepest layers now of science and research it just vindicates the necessity for eating in a plant-based manner. It just highlights more and more how profound that eating approach and living approach really is, much more than we ever even gave it credit for. And as I look at these data that I keep finding and discovering, it just really blows my mind and it makes me smile because I love that discovery of that. It's just magical. I mean, how many millions of dollars in research have been spent just to prove that an apple a day keeps the doctor away? <laughs> right? <laughs> Funny. It's so funny that we have to have so many research studies just to prove what is the most fit food for man, which is so, you know, it, it's so indigenous to us, fruits and vegetables, you know. And it's funny because we now know that the diversity of those organisms is also maintained by that plant-based approach. When they look at these primitive uh, Amerindians or these primitive tribes that are eating much more higher fiber foods without the refined stuff, they see a diversity in their guts that is so dramatically different than the westernization of our gut. And so it's kind of intriguing that as we teach and go back toward what we're teaching with the foods, it's dramatically changing. And I find it also interesting that so much of what happens in the brain, because I was an, I'm a neuroscientist by training too, comes from the gut. We talk about serotonin like a transmitter related to depression. 95% of serotonin is in the bowel. Only 5% is in the brain. So you have to start understanding that how the gut goes, so goes our emotion, so goes our anxiety, so goes our depression, so goes so many things. Just got to heal the gut. You know, one of the first, uh, one of the first influencers in my life in the health, health and wellness world was Dr. Richard Schultz, who you probably remember, may remember. I remember him, yes. From back in the day. He's still around, I guess, but... You know, he's the first person I heard say that health begins in the gut and the disease begins in the gut. And he, you know, I listened, read some of his books and listened to his audio tapes back in the day. And he was just constantly talking about the gut, how important the gut is, you know. And um, it's well, true. And certainly, the, certainly back to fasting, nothing heals the gut lining of the gut like water only fasting. Because if you think about it, if that bowel and that digestive tract is always moving, like with peristaltic waves, the way it's moving, if I cut my arm and I keep doing this on my arm and have that cut heal, it's going to be much slower. So sometimes you just got to give the entire digestive tract a complete rest and you'll see ulcerations heal. You'll see all kinds of things completely heal. So fasting will heal leaky gut faster than probably anything. It allows that gut lining to congeal, to heal. So it's a beautiful thing. So we see that. We see that powerful effect that something like fasting can have even on that very profound state of gut health. Very important. I'm so glad you brought that up because I think a lot of people have never thought about the fact that your, your gut needs a break. 
right, that it needs a break from digestion, just like if you strained your elbow, right, or strained any muscle that you're using, uh, you know, uh, every day, not that you're not using your gut every day, but right, you strain your elbow, well, you might have to put it in a sling and not use it for a week or two and let it heal. Because, you know, if you keep playing tennis, that tennis elbow may, may not heal, right? You have to lay off. You got to get so, it but but that's the fasting does. And fasting will, what it does is a two, two-pronged approach because it allows the tissue to heal. But in the first few days of fasting, even in the first five or so days, nothing will reduce inflammation anywhere in the body, like water-only fasting. I've had people with rheumatoid arthritis with C-reactive protein levels, with CRP is usually used as a marker for inflammation. So when you've got an autoimmune disease like rheumatoid, that CRP can be above 30. We want it under five. I've seen CRP levels of 30 to 40 come down between two to four in three days of fasting. I mean, that's, that's cool. yeah, yeah. That's so awesome. So when you see that, it's so mind blowing to realize. So, so you've got this ability of the gut to be quiet, the bowel lining to heal, inflammation to be reduced, and you've got all the ingredients for incredible healing. And that's why sometimes with these conditions, especially bowel related conditions, it's very profound to take a period of fast. That's why now you see this whole movement with intermittent fasting. It's not really a fast the way we do it, but it's a time restricted period of eating. And at least it gives people 12 or 14 hours where they're not putting stuff constantly into that gut. And we see that even with that short period, we see some very profound effects that occur in lower improving growth hormone, reducing IGF, the insulin-like growth factor again, allowing insulin to regulate, diabetic changes dropping, weight losing, you know. So all of that benefits. So we, we, we are just killing ourselves. Probably the leading cause of disease and death in America is eating. So sometimes you've got to yeah. take a you got to take a break from it. You got to step back from it sometimes. Well, it's about to overtake smoking, as you know. I mean, smoking was the leading killer, but now in 22 states, uh, um, oh, uh, obesity is becoming the leading killer. Yeah, and that's it's, food. It's caused by because obesity affects everything. It affects type two diabetes. It increases. We know for the fact that can that fat cells are producing some of the most profound cancer-causing agents in the human body. So elevated body fat, elevated obesity is a primary cancer risk, and it's a major cause of many varieties of cancer, which I find intriguing because you would think that getting fatter could promote like hormone-induced cancers like estrogen and testosterone are released from fat cells. So you would think like breast cancer, prostate cancer, and so on. But one of the most profound cancers that happens with obesity is leukemia. We see like bloodborne cancers. We see things that you wouldn't even expect happening with that increase in obesity and body fat. So we definitely have to get that down. And again, nothing is better than the, you know, the, the, the low calorie dense plant-based approach for allowing you to eat volumes of food while losing that weight and that fat and improving and reducing those risks. It's remarkable. I'm glad you brought that up too, because the cool thing about eating a plant-based diet, especially when you eat a lot of raw food too, raw fruits and vegetables, is you can stuff yourself. You right. can. There's no restriction. You don't have to be hungry ever. Right. I always tell people it's about eating well, not less, because that mentality of, of deprivation has so pervaded that weight loss field. And what it's done is it's made people crazy, because they realize. <laughs> eating less and less and they're walking around starving and they can't take weight off. And I say, you just got to sit down and eat a salad the size of a family that would feed a family of four, load it up with some starches and just go to town and just eat that way routinely. You'll never be hungry. Your weight will drop off like it's, you know, falling off the plate. And, and that, that's a remarkable emancipation when people finally realize that because for the longest time they felt this deprivation had to be the way. Well, the giant salad was a staple in my uh, cancer healing diet twice a day. I mean, like lunch and dinner every single day was a giant salad with every vegetable I could cram in there. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I, we're on the same page there. So you've overseen somewhere around 10,000 people go water through fast. a water fast. Over of, 40, we're talking about over 40 years now. So over 40 years at various lengths. Would you talk about 
the process that, and, and I know it varies from person to person, but generally speaking, the, the fasting journey, the process, like the ideal amount of time that if someone is being supervised in a fast, how long they would go and what that experience would be like for them. Well, usually when people come to fast, we have to do a, a pretty comprehensive intake first. So we do a complete blood workup and there's certain markers that we look for. I'll do an interview. I want to find out why they want to do this. Um, they can't fast when they're on medication. So we have to really go around it and dance around it. Though, if we have time, I'll talk about some interesting relationships of fasting to cancer chemo which have come out of recent research that is actually pretty mind blowing in terms of the protection that cancer provides under those conditions. Yeah. But let's the, circle back to that for sure. Yeah. So what we, what we do is that I make, when they come in, we may, I make rounds twice a day, morning, evening, we're checking all of that. They're under resting conditions and most people's fasting time is dictated by the time that they have. Nobody usually comes with an open ended state, but I think anymore we tend to limit the fast to no longer, I haven't really fasted anybody at Balance for Life longer than three weeks, but I have fasted them for 21 days at Balance for Life. And this was someone with lymphoma. And lymphoma is one of those cancers that dramatically responds to fasting care. In fact, uh, the people out of True North, Alan Goldhammer and his group, they published a case study in, in one of the British journals on non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and they show, and you see remarkable shrinkage of these tumors and growths during the fasting state. And that's part of that autophagy that I talked about before. Because in fasting, the body will use everything that it needs least to provide support for what it needs most. So what does it need most? It needs heart and liver and kidney and brain. What does it need least? Tumors and cysts and growths. So it usually, through the autophagic pathways, will literally break those things down by what we call protective autophagy, take from them whatever building blocks and nutrients it can take and then feed normal cells and main, put the body in a maintenance mode by breaking those tissues down. I've had women with uterine fibroids the size of grapefruits completely dissolved in two weeks of fasting. I've seen women with breasts that look like shrapnel on a mammogram, fibrocystic change, in five to seven days of fasting completely clear. Of course, the doctors always claim it's a remission and had nothing to do with fasting, but we know that that's not true because we see that very commonly. So what we do is after, by day three, they are usually shifting into fat metabolism. So we see more ketosis at that point. The brain is capable of taking those ketones, using them directly as a primary energy source. So they can go pretty extended periods depending on how you're starting with reserves into a fasting process. In my experience, I've had fasted people longer than 40 days. I've been in clinics that fasted them longer than 50 days. But that's a very rare situation. For the most part, they're shorter periods. And then it's very it's imperative that you leave as much time to break, half as much time to break the fast as you do fasting. So if you fast two weeks, I need you to stay with me another week so we can refeed you. Because the refeeding process is a very real and important part the success of the fasting process. And I think you can appreciate it. if you're not eating for two weeks, how you get back into eating is going to be some of the art to making that a very comfortable journey. Otherwise it could be very uncomfortable. So we go with, you know, raw juices diluted and we go full strength juices, mostly green juices. And then we move into simple fruits and then simple veggies and steams, you know, so we do that in a whole pattern. But we monitor people twice daily. We go through everything. We can do urine checks, temperature checks, blood pressure checks, pulse checks. We're looking at vitals for the most part. If they're coming in with a major autoimmune disease, we may have to draw a blood in a longer fast during the fast and look at the blood work even during the fasting state. And that's why I like if people are going to fast longer than two or three days, I think it's best done under supervision. Uh, because I, now there's a lot of these fasting groups online that are kind of scary to me. I'll be reading like one of these Facebook groups and someone will say, well, I'm in the 21st day of my fast and I got this discharge. Anybody got any ideas? I'm like, oh, God, don't do that. So we're seeing that. I don't think that's in people's best interest. Even more, I've been drinking my own urine for 21 days. <laughs> Well, you are hydrated. Yes, that's true. But anyway, yeah. 
So anyway, uh, I don't know if you have any specific questions about fasting. By the third, by the fourth day of fasting, there's already what we see as a stem cell activation of white blood cells. So there's almost a reboot of the immune system that happens as early as the fourth day. By five to seven, tremendous changes in inflammation. So people with pain, and different, they start to not feel that. You just don't feel it anymore. Everything's kind of clearing out. But I got to tell you, the way you eat after the fast becomes imperative. And I see fast as a jump start to getting into the diet like we've talked about, that plant-only approach, because if you follow the fast with that, your results are incredibly consistent and they ongoing and you just have this remarkable transformation that will occur. But if you go back to the same old stuff, it can set you back. After yeah, if you treat it like a crash diet and then go back to McDonald's. Yeah, it's not what it's about. But one nice thing about it, because fasting is such an introspective journey, that there is a lot of self-reflection and it tends to promote people breaking addictions, getting onto a better path and wanting to follow that, wanting to take better care of themselves. And especially when you realize that on a fast, there's as much emotional and you can even argue spiritual detoxification as there is physical. So yeah. I spend a lot of time talking with people and we process those things that come up. And if I felt they needed more than me, I would be the first person to bring in a good psychologist or somebody to have them to communicate because you can go through such tremendous personal transformation on a fast that's not just physical. And that's a powerful tool. Usually people start to feel pretty good and have a, a decent amount of energy around the fourth day, right? Well, what will happen is we're usually around the third day, they really lose appetite because now they're really leaning on fat reserves. So they're eating their own fat tissue. Uh, what will happen though is people <clears throat> can go through cycles. So you can feel energetic, but I find that as you get toward the end of the first week, many times going into a second week, the body pulls that energy internal. So there can be a lot of internal stuff. So out here, you may feel a little bit drained. And the key is that you've just got to rest. And in our culture, that's not an easy thing to do because we have so much chatter that's constantly pulling us outside of ourselves with all the information processing that we do, that going internal and taking that introspective time is an interesting dance in this culture. But it's a profound one if you can even use it as a digital fast. Put all of that stuff down. Allow yourself that introspective component. Very powerful if you can do that. Yeah, I second that. So... Talk, will you talk a little more about rest? Because you're, you know, when someone comes to your clinic, you want them to be resting. Like, what do you mean by resting? What, what I does mean your day look like? Yeah, okay, well, let's talk about that. Uh, if you think about it, we live in a culture of stimulation. So mo most people are eating refined foods with all these chemicals that provoke a stimulating effect. Most people can't make it past the first few hours of the morning without coffee. So the bottom line is, that's why Dr. Starbuck has such a busy practice in most people's community, because everybody's running in there to get their fix. So we live in a nation that is not burning the candle out at both ends. They're cutting it in three or four places and burning it out at six, eight, and ten ends. But then we don't have time because I got the job, I got the meeting, I got the kids, I got this, I got that. So I can't take the time to replenish my own energy reserve. So what do I got to do? I got to look for something that jolts me and gives me that artificial boost. So they get on that roller coaster of what I call stimulation and depression because you're really living on borrowed time. You're writing checks with no money in the bank. It's not your energy. It's like, so what happens is, you go up and then you crash to the next stimulant, maybe another cup of coffee, maybe something with sugar. So by the time I see people that come in to do a fast, they've been on that roller coaster of stimulation and depression. So as much as they've been stimulated, they're actually physiologically remarkably depressed and energy depleted. So if I, when they come in, if we take away coffee and we take away sugar and we take, the first thing that's going to happen is this remarkable crash. And so when I say rest, I'm saying in a fasting state, as much as you can do it on every level, physical, physiological, with your senses, you can listen to music, you can watch movies, but don't do it 24 hours a day. Understand that you're now trying to harbor energy on every imaginable level that you can. And it's not easy for people to do it because, you know, people bring laptops, they bring this, they got business. But I try to talk them into taking as much time as they can to allow that fast to really work 
with the harboring of energy on every imaginable level. And if you do that, it's incredible the healing that can occur when that happens. Because you know where the body has this intelligence. We don't need to tell it. It's it's a divine it's a divine capability. What what uh, what people call spirit in action. It's happening within us. I love when people say, "I got to help the liver detox." The liver doesn't need our help to detox. The liver just needs us to get out of the way so we can do the job that it was created to do. There's a plan bigger than our intellect minds involved in how the body works and detoxifies and all of that. So this is getting out of the way. What one of my mentors used to call the intelligent art of doing nothing and doing it intelligently. Because it's not you getting out of the way and just allowing the body to do what it was created to do. And I will guarantee you it knows a lot more than any of our intellectual minds know on a fundamental level. I, I love it because it's so simple right? And tr truth is simple. Truth is always simple. But it's also hard, you know? Yeah. It is hard for people to unplug. It's hard to, for them to break addictions, right? It's hard. Absolutely. I mean, it's so necessary. It's so vital. It's so important. But I, I just want to acknowledge the fact that I get it. Like, it's difficult. We're, that's we're why, so overstanding. That's, that's why fasting is so transformative. Because if you can get yourself to that place, it is so far into the way our lives are normally led that it just transforms everything about your perception and your capability and your insight and how you're dealing with the world. And you can take that back. It doesn't mean you're not going to go back into the fray. You're not going to go back into the helter skelter nature of what many of us have to constantly deal with, but you've got a, a renewed way of looking at the world. It's, a, it's almost like you've gone on this transformative trip that could be akin to even some psychedelic experience that someone may have had. I mean, you, you're actually getting a different view of how you see this world, and you can actually see the pace in front of you while you're operating from a place of calm, looking at that almost madness that goes on around us a lot of the time. And I think we, especially now, we need that more than ever. And we need that more than ever in our young... I have, I have millennial children, you know, and they grow up in a place where I could see the level of how they operate in, a, in an anxiety state of mind at times because of the way they process information. And so we're getting to a place where our children and the culture will no longer be able to be able to step back in an introspective way. They will almost not have the neurological system that allows them to do that. And I really believe now that's why there's such an interest, again, in things like yoga and tai chi and all of these introspective activities that in a sense kind of counterbalance the information superhighway that we have to fly on on a daily basis. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so, because they're always plugged in. We need this introspective stuff even more now than we ever have in the past, is my point. And, I'm, and, and I think people are feeling that on every level at every age. I just had someone come, ten, did a 10-day fast, 20-year-old kid, because she realized that she needed to step back, and she did, and it was cool. So, you know, we're seeing it more and more, but we need to engender more of that in our culture while we take advantage of, of the technologies and the things that are developing and evolving because they're cool. A lot of it can be very cool as long as it's not causing you to be debilitated and broken down. And that's where we walk that fine line between the technology and actual personal health and sanity. You know, it's a kind of a fine line in between there sometimes. It's interesting too, to think about how, you know, the, the, the surge in popularity of, like you said, things like yoga and Tai Chi uh, and even meditation because and I, I had not really connected these dots until now and I'm, maybe I'm not connecting them, but, you know, in years past and decades past, generations past, people had a lot more free time. <laughs> they had a lot more quiet time, right? And it just... And so they didn't really need to seek out more quiet time. And now people are like deliberately trying to find quiet time. Well, I'll give you a blast from the past. When I was my son's age, let's say early 20s to mid 20s, I lived in New York. I lived near the Botanical Garden in New York. When I wanted to decompress, I took a walk into that park. I hung out for a whole afternoon. I had no cell phone. There were no cell phones. So if I didn't make a phone call at a pay phone, there was no call to make. And so you couldn't be found. You had your isolation in whatever way you wanted it. You had those moments when you came back out, you interacted with anyone whenever you felt like you wanted to. So now 
I still feel like with all the demands that I have in terms of my business and work, there are times I don't carry my cell phone. I just don't carry it. I figure I'll get back to it when I can. And I just don't want to be found. There's times when I just don't want to be found. And that's kind of a residual to a kind of a life that I lived much more in the past. But I think there's a replenishment that goes with that. Sometimes you just need that introspective time. Sometimes you just need to decompress. And um, if you go in a supermarket now, you go into a place like Publix, it's amazing. On the rack, you see five or six magazines and the cover is mindfulness or relaxation or happy so you're seeing the this rebound of we got to really set these kinds of things in motion now because there's so many pulls that are pulling us away from our ability to just be peaceful with ourselves and there's a certain aspect of health that requires that sense of inner peace a certain amount of that that we have to engender for the outcome of high quality functional health yeah, you know, it's I, I definitely remember those times because I'm 42, so I grew up without the internet. I mean, the internet really started to take off when I was in college. That's when the first time I used email was in college. So, like, yeah, I grew up uh, without a cell phone, without email, without yeah. using the internet for anything. <laughs> and so I definitely remember what that was like. And, uh, you know... I, even even just maybe 10 years ago when I would get up when I was in the real estate business, you know, before I was doing the crispy cancer blog and everything, I would get up. I wouldn't get on the internet. I wouldn't get on my phone. I didn't have a smartphone. I would get up. I would, you know, make breakfast or whatever. And then I would get out my notepad typically and start thinking about my day and what I needed to get done. And there was no distractions really to speak of, you know, I mean, I could turn the TV on and watch the Today Show or something, right? But that was uh, not something I usually did. So it was just like, nothing was trying to grab my attention all the time. And it, I had so much more, I, think, I, I don't know, so much more, but I definitely, it was much easier to be clear and focused on what I needed to be doing and what my priorities were. And now, yeah, we all have just, just limitless, unlimited number of distractions and pings and beeps and blurps and messages and notifications, like all this stuff. It's ridiculous. So back to what we were talking about, when people come to fast, I try to reestablish that space that we just talked about in yeah. the fasting process. Because I find if they can even get into that space somewhat in the few days or a week that they fast, it can be almost transformative. They, they can have a reacquaintance with themselves they can have that reconnection with themselves and, and we need to reconnect with ourselves yeah and be comfortable being alone you know there's a great quote and i'm going to butcher it um <laughs> but it's something like most of the world's problems you know would not exist if man could simply sit alone in a room and be quiet <laughs> I mean, it's really true and, uh, what was it, Virginia Satir, one of the family therapists, she said it's those journeys, that, that inner, that introspective activity, whatever, whatever it is, prayer, meditation, whatever, is how we allow ourselves to discover the treasure that is called by our name. And I love that quote because it's about that, that divine core that really exists within each of us. And the bottom line is we get disengaged from that. Our ego concerns pull us away from that spiritual center that really is the all that connects us all. And I think that when we connect to more of that, and this is why I like even eating in a plant-based manner because it builds in that idea of promoting health as a love affair with self, but also with respect for all life around us and the planet itself on which we live. So it connects the all. It, it makes that kind of spiritual connection without you even thinking about it but it reaffirms that sense of introspective discovery of that divine core that connects us all. And I like that. I love that. I found the quote. Here it is in, in, its, uh, in its accurate state. <laughs> all of humanity's problems stem from man's inability to sit quietly in a room alone. Blaise Pascal. <laughs> so. And that goes back a long way, Blaise Pascal. It's a long time to go. 
and he had a lot of time alone, so that was cool. A good philosopher. Yeah, just, quiet and hey, sit quietly in a room alone, get to know yourself. And I'm fortunate, Balance for Life, we had that ocean right in front. There are times when I got a break, I'll just go out and just stare at that ocean. That's my Chicago. Oh, right yeah. Now. And and That's we should talk about that because your facility is is in beautiful, great facility, right on the beach. Like, and you just, and it's a beautiful beach, you know, it's, it's, what part of Florida is that technically? It's Deerfield Beach, Florida. So it's right south, it's a little bit south of Boca, a little bit north of Fort Lauderdale. But especially at this time of year right now, the ocean is that temperature where you can be in it like 12 hours a day. It's like a bath. It's a beautiful bath, clear turquoise. And, and so, look, there's times when I just go out and I'll just do a standing, uh, like a standing meditation, with my body fully submerged in water, just looking at the sun. And this is something about that that's remarkable. And that's another thing about people coming to the center because – What's nice about fasting, where I am, it's been the easiest place that I've ever fasted people because if you are in this hotel where I am and you're fasting, you're spending a lot of time in your room, those oceanfront rooms have the sunrise because we're right on the east. So you get sunrise, the doors open, you get all those breezes off the ocean, you can go down and read and sit on the beach. So there's a lot of really beautiful environmental stuff for that kind of introspection. It's very cool. Very cool. Yeah, not to mention the just yeah, the grounding and earthing. You know, all, being on the beach, the negative ions, all that good stuff. And I teach Tai Chi, so I many times I teach it out there, right on the grass and the sand. It's just fabulous to do that. You know, it's just a beautiful thing to do. So that's cool. Okay, so what? Um, what I feel like was there something else that we that we wanted to touch on. We didn't start. We didn't really get into the deep story of the cancer story, which we can get. Yes, into. yes, let's do that. And we have a little time now. We can do it. But what's intriguing is that we now know that that autophagy that fasting creates that generates. We made the point that when you stop taking in sugar and protein and food, the body drops that insulin-like growth factor. That drops down. And so that triggers a process in the cell where the cell says, ah, no nutrients are coming in, so I'm going to trigger this process where internally I can start cleaning house. I can take all these broken proteins and broken pieces of the cell, and I can do all of that, and I can literally do this house cleaning. And you've got a backup digestive system in the cell called a lysosome that has acid enzymes just like our gut. And it releases these enzymes after this debris is brought into it, takes the building blocks of proteins and fats and makes those available for the maintenance and repair of the body. So we call that protective autophagy. And we find that that, auto, that, that autophagy pathway responds to um, stressful environmental conditions. So, for example, if a cell is being damaged, like with inflammation and there's some hypoxia or lack of oxygen or necrosis of the cell, the, um, that is how a cell starts the primary initiation of cancer. There's an infl inflammatory cells come into a necrotic area that's hypoxic, and they begin that initiation process. Autophagy actually creates a situation where it reduces that inflammation, cleans up that necrotic tissue, and can actually also promote the uh, breakdown of cancer tissue. So protective autophagy is one of the ways the body can actually stop the primary induction of cancer in any tissue. And nothing inspires that like fasting does. So in the initial stages to me of a cancer development, what we call at the primary site, um, fasting may be an incredibly valuable tool for preventing that initiation and progression of cancer just by that protective autophagic thing. The other thing it also does is that when cells go on in their normal function, organelles in the cells like mitochondria where all the energy is made, they get damaged. And when mitochondria are damaged, they create reactive oxygen species that we call free radicals. Those free radicals change the genetic machinery of the cell and can mutate it into a cancer cell. So what happens is autophagy cleans up that metabolic debris of the mitochondria. It literally takes those, absorbs them, breaks them down, and takes from them so that they can't create the free radical damage that would link with genetic damage to the cell. So we see in autophagy a, a huge tool 
for promoting the reduction of cancer expression, cancer progression, cancer initiation, and nothing promotes that protective autophagy like fasting does. So that's pretty remarkable. Uh, the research that Luongo and other people showed, I thought was interesting because they found that when, when you have uh, short-term starvation or fasting, even two to three days, both normal and cancer cells will reduce that insulin-like growth factor that we talked about. But the problem is because cancer cells have a lot of mutation, they're really geared for growth and not adapting to challenging stressful conditions. So the stressful condition of starvation or fasting, in a sense, confuses the cancer cell so that while it may reduce growth, it, sensitize, it creates this process where the cell becomes sensitized to more toxic agents. So we find that people that do pre-fast, even if they're taking cancer chemo, let's suppose they choose to do that, what they find is that the cells, the normal cells of the body are protected by the fast so they don't have the damaging effects of cancer chemo. They don't have the nausea, they have a lot less of all of that. And yet at the same time, the cancer cells themselves become more prone to damage by the toxic elements of the drug. So fasting will reduce cancer growth, make the cells more sensitive to the toxic effects of whatever it is you're trying to use to kill them, while protecting normal cells against the toxic effects of the chemo. So this perked up the ears of medicine because they said, oh my God, the simple process of just not feeding people two days before they do chemo had all of this protective effect. So I think you're going to see even medicine kind of jump on the bandwagon uh, because of the fact that you have this protective effect while also sensitizing cancer cells to chemo while not sensitizing normal cells to it. So, you know, you think about people that go through the horror of doing chemotherapy and all of the stuff that happens to them when they do it. You may kill the cancer cells, but you kill so much else in the process, and you're vomiting, and you're nauseous, and you're just like a mess. So we now see that even short fasts can actually eliminate some of that outcome for people who actually eventually choose to do that kind of treatment. That is really but, fascinating. It also addresses the idea that in the early stages of cancer development, you may want to consider things like fasting and plant-based nutrition because we know that that will actually stop the initiation and growth of that cancer. Because think about this, every cell of the body has what are called oncogenes, which promote cancer, and tumor suppressor genes. So those are in every cell of the body. But you saw that study that Ornish did years ago where they took prostate cancer, they took cancer cells from the prostate cancer put those people, those men, on a three-month plant-based approach with five days of walking and some stress management, and over 450 genes that would normally express cancer were turned off by that lifestyle approach. So think about that, because I want to share this message of hope with people, because a lot of times when you get that diagnosis, as you well know, it's almost as if someone sucked the hope out of your brain. You just feel like your life has no value and there's no way that you're going to survive. We now know that these epigenetic effects, these effects of lifestyle and nutrition and food and even fasting can absolutely modify how those cells express cancer, protect themselves against cancer, and even reverse cancer and stop metastasis. And that's a very important message because we, we, we want to instill that sense of hope for people that are having to deal with this incredible pathology. For anybody uh, wanting to to know more about that. I interviewed Dr. Walter Longo uh, last year, maybe the year before, but we talked about this ongoing research with fasting right. around chemotherapy and how it made cancer cells more sensitive to chemotherapy and made healthy cells more resistant to damage right. from chemo. So I'll link to that in the show notes if anybody wants to you know, yeah. go down that rabbit trail. It, it's, it's amazing. It's so when fascinating. You combine, when you combine that with the combination of fasting, feeding protective autophagy that stops the initiation and progression of cancer, you've got some very powerful tools that are at your disposal. And in fact, even other lifestyle effects. We know, for example, women that exercise 150 minutes a week doing some form of activity like walking will turn off a number of known genes that are known to instill and initiate breast cancer outcome. 
it can be as much as a 60% reduction in the expression of those genes just from the simple act of walking. 12 minutes of meditation a day, similar effects on suppressing the expression of cancer genes. So, so many lifestyle pieces that are just, and I, and I think that's really fantastic to see that connection of these lifestyle choices that we've always touted, but having this effect at the deepest cellular level that we can measure. It's a profound thing. It's a profound outcome. It's beautiful. It really is. Simple stuff. Simple it's stuff. very simple stuff. So things that almost anyone can do. Obviously, a long fast, you need some supervision. Uh, and um, Balance for Life also does, uh, I, should, we want, uh, I want to make sure people understand this too, it's not just for fasting. People come down there and do like a plant-based two or three A whole right? food plant-based approach without any added salt, oil, or sugar, so it's non-SOS. And uh, we have an incredible food program. And we have many people that come just to eat and do the program. They just want a healthy vacation. They're trying to get their blood pressure down, lose some pounds, do that. And they come and they don't fast. But we're one of a few of the few only water only fasting centers so we can do that. But our lifestyle approach is remarkable because we have stress management, yoga every day, Tai Chi, all the plant based foods, you know, so we got a nice program and we're on the ocean, which you can't be because you can be outside on the ocean environment anytime. How often do you think someone should fast? Just for health, you know, I just... Think, I think if you're eating the way we're talking about, you don't need to do it very often. I think you can probably do a, a few days or maybe even a week and a year, once in a year, maybe just as a house cleaning kind of resting process or even longer. If you're not eating the way we're talking about, my advice is you better start eating the way we're talking about because we know the risks associated, but you may need to do more of that kind of stuff. And I tell people maybe ongoing... The way to go is to just work an intermittent fasting program. Like we have, we serve dinner at 5.30 to 6.30 at our place and breakfast is not till 8.15 next morning. So that's 14 hours. So you're at least getting that 14.10 cycle and that'll even give you a break for all of that addictive behavior that we have with food, many times eating all night and noshing and, you know, all of that stuff. So I would even go into a time-restricted pattern of eating and let that work for you for a while without necessarily committing to a water fast. And then when maybe you can, take a two-day period or a three-day period on a long weekend and see what that feels like. Just to lay in bed, rest, read, do stuff you've always wanted to do in a resting state. And, but if you've got a serious pathology and you want to consult and talk, then they can go on our website, balanceforlifeflorida.com. They can get all that info. The phone numbers are there. There's a way to get in touch with me by email on that. I even have my own URL, drfranksabatino.com. They can go on. I have articles and things. But the Balance for Life website has all kinds of blogs and informational stuff about fasting. So if they want to pursue that, all of that is available to them at no charge, at no cost. Good. We'll link to that in the show notes. Well, Dr. Frank, I want to be respectful of your time. I appreciate you taking the time so much to, to share your wisdom with me and my audience. And uh, a great time, Chris. Thank you so much for inviting me. I really mean that. Yeah, great to have you. Brace yourself. You'll probably get a lot of emails. <laughs> That's great. All right. Okay. Thank you. Care, Thanks, brother. Dr. Frank. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Please share this video with people that you care about. Uh, this is important stuff. The world needs to know. And uh, I will see you all on the next one. Bye. Bye bye.